Thank you so very much, uh, Daniel, and to the center. Uh, I also want to thank especially uh, uh, Alexandra Roberts, who uh, made everything uh, work out. So thank you, Alex, for, for all of your really your great help. Um, I also want to thank all of you for being here, because I know it's the end of the semester and everyone's getting ready either uh, to grade exams, take exams, or um, go shopping. So, so thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time out. And those of you who are watching online, I also appreciate you. I don't know why you're doing it, but uh, uh, very happy to have you virtually with us. So my title, Forbidden Knowledge, Technology, the Liberal Arts, and the Future of Humanity is going to touch on a few very minor themes, uh, really not very big topics. Uh, and to begin with, um, I think it's fair to say that we are uh, on the cusp, if not in the midst, of a new revolution, a revolution that perhaps is not unlike that of the, the, the revolution that came about with the discovery of bronze and the utilization of bronze, or the revolution uh, that, that uh, led to the beginnings of the agricultural age, the industrial revolution, uh, the age of information, and perhaps we are entering something along the lines of the age of singularity, a, t a term that often is used without necessarily knowing what exactly what is me what one means, and I'm not sure what I mean by it, but it seems to be something along the lines of the point at which we become our technology and our technology becomes us, that we have made the thing uh, that in a sense makes us, uh, and they are now uh, in some senses joined. I'm often told, especially by students, maybe there are a few of you in the audience, uh, so-called digital natives, that we boomers have no idea uh, about what's going on and, and uh, uh, in particular not having lived and, uh, and grown up in the midst of this, uh, of this transformational age. And it's difficult not to agree with them that something fundamentally new has taken place. Those of us who've lived through this technological revolution that really has transformed almost every aspect of our lives in just over a decade. I mean, it's iPhone 15 now. It's amazing to think 15 years ago or 16 years ago, there was no iPhone. Uh, and how much that is just, or whatever its version of it, how much that has just, it's absolutely uh, uh, simply a part of our lives. You watch a show older or a movie older than 15 years and you think how strange that they're smoking cigarettes and no one's using an iPhone. How antiquated that is. So in one sense, I absolutely can't but agree that something fundamental has taken place. Uh, and in, in that sense, in some ways, we have maybe already begun thinking of a new way of dating the human ages to that of BCE, which is before uh, the coming of Elon, and uh, AD, I don't have a really good one for that, I've been trying to think of it, but maybe after digital fingerprinting or something, I'll think of something better. I was going to say just AJ, after jobs. And yet, when I hear also such pronouncements, I'm also quick to think and perhaps correct my students that at least on at least one count, that the human entwinement with technology is not new. In fact, on this score, our, the human entwinement with technology in some senses constitutes the very essence of our humanity. Because it's clear that there would be no humanity but for technology. There would be no humanity but for the fact that we are the tool using creature. So while we are called officially homo sapiens, the thinking or the knowing creature, it is perhaps more accurate to call us homo techne, the technological creature. Now I'm cautious to mention anything in the classical languages because my friend Christian Koff is here, professor emeritus of classics from here at University, Colorado University. But techne is an ancient Greek word meaning art or skill or craft, and is associated with implications, meaning to make or to fashion or to, but, or to devise. One way of thinking about its opposite is the word phusis or nature, the word from which we derive the word physics. That which exists independent of human contrivance or fashioning. So you have techne are the things that human beings make or contrive, and phusis, the stuff that sort of just is, it's out there, it just exists, either God created it or it has uh, just come about because of some big bang. So a mountain, which I'm very glad to be in the midst of coming from South Bend, Indiana, is an example of phusis. 
But I, I dare say that the mountains you have around here are probably also considerably influenced by Tecne. Somebody was pointing out to me, this is one of the best walking paths uh, in the nearby uh, countryside. And so Tecne already in some ways has invaded or restructured or at least left a mark on the mountain. And all of the ways that we divert and redirect water or stones or extract minerals from these mountains, these are all various forms of the way we use techne on the natural world. In fact, we are so pervasively surrounded and conditioned by techne that we don't often really notice it. It just is everywhere. Just look around this room. Everything in this room, there's no nature here. Everything in this room is techne. Everything is the result of our fashioning, right? Crafting or fashioning or devising. The chairs that are here, the lights, the stage or whatever podium, the new room temperature, the plumbing that you may or may not have used, the clothing that we're wearing, glasses. If you have any pieces of techne in your bodies, hips, right? Fillings, stents, you name it. Techne is everywhere, even in our nature implanted in us, pacemakers. All these and so much more are ubiquitous in our environs, these forms of techne. Indeed, one challenge of the modern world is finding evidence where techne is not, finding spaces or places where there is no techne, that, the, that kind of search, the kind of Henry David Thoreau search for the genuinely untouched places. From the earliest writings of the Western tradition, and I'm, I'll use the word Western tradition to please my, my hosts here uh, a few times, but from the earliest writings in our tradition, our condition as technological creatures has been well noted and quite often celebrated. Consider these lines from the play Antigone by Sophocles written in 442 BC. Numberless wonders, Terrible wonders walk the world, but none the match for man. That great wonder crossing the heaving gray sea, driven on by blasts of winter, on through breakers crashing left and right, holds his course and the oldest of the gods he wears away, the earth, the immortal, the inexhaustible, as his plow goes back and forth year in, year out, with breeds of stallions turning up the furrows. This is, a, this is a, a, a chorus ode, sometimes called Ode to Man, in the midst of Antigone. The ode continues, man the skilled, the brilliant, he conquers all, taming with his techniques the prey that roams the cliffs and the wild lairs, training the stallion, clamping the yoke across his shaggy neck and the tireless mountain bull, and speech and thought quick as the wind, and the mood and mind for law that rules the city. All these he has taught himself and shelter from the arrows of frost. And there's rough lodging under the cold, clear sky and the shafts of lashing rain. Ready, resourceful man, never without resources. <clears throat> One of the things I would love about this, um, this ode that it, uh, among the things it names as techne is law and the city. These are forms of techne. We may not recognize them as such, but they're forms of techne just as much as a tool as the yoke on the back of the horse's neck. Myth and storytelling have long recognized that human beings would not exist, that human, the human creature would have perished long ago and perhaps without a trace, if not for our capacity to employ technologies that compensate and then some for the absence of natural powers that seems to be in some ways unique among human beings. And when I say natural powers, the things that in some ways exist without techne. Updating these myths from ancient Greece, the Renaissance thinker, thinker Pico della Mirandola composed an oration in 1487 entitled On the Dignity of Man, in which he described, he kind of did a redescription of, Prome of the Prometheus myth in which he described God's fashioning of all creatures at the time of creation. Pico related that God bestowed a succession of talents or abilities or natural tools upon each creature, great speed or ability to burrow or flight 
or the size and trunk of something like an elephant and so forth. But then God, slightly perhaps heretical moment on Pico's part, had an afterthought, like, Prome like Epimethea, Epimetheus, had an afterthought to create a creature that he thought, maybe this, I need a creature that will worship me. And he creates a creature that would understand and admire his handiwork, but realized he distributed all of the gifts and natural talents to all the creatures already, which again, is kind of heretical that God couldn't think of something else, but there's a reason why he was brought on trial for heresy. So that God then created this creature and said, you are in charge of making your own gifts, of making your own way. The great artisan made man a creature of indeterminate and indifferent nature. And placing him in the middle of the world, he said to him, Adam, we give you no fixed place to live, no form that is peculiar to you, nor any function that is yours alone. According to your desires and judgment, you will have and possess whatever place to live, whatever form, and whatever functions you yourself choose. All other things have a limited and fixed nature prescribed and bounded by our laws. You, with no limit or no bound, may choose for yourself the limits and bounds of your nature. We have placed you at the world center so that you may survey everything in the world. We have made you neither of heavenly nor of earthly stuff, neither mortal nor immortal, so that with free choice and dignity, you may fashion yourself into whatever form you choose. Long before the techno-optimism of the likes of Elon Musk or Peter Thiel, one sees in these phrases, whether in the Antigone or in Pico, a kind of confidence, even bold confidence, perhaps heretical confidence in the capacities, the limitless capacities for human inventiveness. And only through the ongoing development of human knowledge about nature and our ability to manipulate and control nature based upon that knowledge could humanity flourish. A watershed in the Western tradition were the arguments of Francis Bacon, who envisioned an early utopia, the New Atlantis. This utopia, and now I want to use this word with some care, uh, is the tradition begun by Thomas More, whose book literally was called Utopia. For those of you who know this book, a great book of the Western tradition, Western civilization, Utopia is the letter U, which in Latin means no, and topia in the Greek means place, topos. So it's no place. Bacon gives us the first utopia, which is the forerunner of the television show, The Good Place, the actual utopia that's, that's believed to be realizable. The New Atlantis is organized around the belief that the good political and social order will come about when there is a government essentially by scientists or the society is ruled in the most deepest and profound way by the scientists who have the liberty to pursue all forms of knowledge and investigate all forms of knowledge. Among the things that are pursued on the island of the New Atlantis, those things include, and I quote here, the prolongation of life, the restitution of youth, the retardation of age, the altering of complexions, of fatness, and of leanness, plastic surgery, the altering of statures, the increasing and exalting of the intellectual parts. That's, uh, um, uh, what's, the, what's the drug? Um, uh, yeah, also I was thinking of uh, Ritalin, but yeah, memory pills, that's, that's that. The making of new species, instruments of destruction as of war and poison, impressions of air and raising of tempests, natural divinations. All of these things sound pretty familiar to us. And this was envisioned as what that which would bring about the good place, the realizable good place. Bacon thus proposed a utopia, e-utopia, the good place that would allow humans ultimately to master not only the natural world, but to perfect their own natures through their own instruments, not through ethical development per se, but by scientific discovery and technological uh, advancement of our own natures. This confidence in the self-fashioning through the development of an array of tools and technologies was embraced wholesale or nearly wholesale in America or substantially in America, whether through the storied inventiveness of Benjamin Franklin or the scientific confidence that marked the main thinkers of the progressive movement. 
Notably, one of the most important thinkers in the progressive movement, John Dewey, declared in one of his works called A Reconstruction in Philosophy, Francis Bacon was the forerunner of the spirit of modern life and the real founder of modern thought. Dewey analogized the scientific undertaking, uh, undertaking to that of a prison interrogation. Here I quote Bacon from that book, Reconstruction in Philosophy. He, the scientist, must force the apparent facts of nature into forms different to those in which they familiarly present themselves, as torture may compel an unwilling witness to reveal what it has been concealing. So the scientist is like the torturer who extracts the secrets from an unwilling uh, uh, prisoner. Now this tradition that I'm tracing here, you know, we started all the way back in Antigone and our, here we are with John Dewey, only who dies only a few, you know, just a few decades ago, is one that deeply shapes contemporary belief and even constitutes what technology uh, scholars, Jennifer Slack and J. McGregor Wise in a book called Technology and Culture have called the received view of technology, one of optimism and confidence regarding the prospects and the necessity and inescapability of technological progress. And this view, as they argue, is one that deeply constitutes the Western tradition, its literary, philosophical, and theological tradition. It is unavoidable to encounter if one studies the great texts of our civilization, the Western tradition. It forms a main theme of what Michael Oakeshott called the great conversation, in which he says we are all heirs and participants. But that's one part of the story. There's another part of the story, another thread that forms a part of this great conversation that casts this tradition as less univocal and perhaps as one of an intense internal debate. And when we say the Western tradition, it's not always just one thing. And that's what makes it continuously interesting. And of course, formative. And grained within that same tradition is a deep and pervasive disposition of caution and ambivalence toward both knowledge pursued without limit and the very technology that in one guise makes us human and in another threatens the essence of our humanity. This, this tradition has been described as one that enjoins the inquiry into forbidden knowledge, which is the title and theme of a magisterial 1996 book by the hum humanist scholar Roger Shattuck. Really wonderful book that I recommend if you're interested in these questions. Starts with this, the, the, well, what this picture is here, the Garden of Eden, and takes us all the way through debates over pornography and computer and internet and so forth. If, we had, if you had a few more decades to write it, we'd get up to some, some pretty contemporary things. This literary and philosophic tradition that describes forbidden knowledge and forbidden technology reflects a pedigree as ancient and as continuous as the celebrations of human ingenuity that I was just mentioning. Of course, we encounter it in the oldest of our most ancient texts, notably, of course, the Bible, in which Adam and Eve are expelled from the Garden of Eden, not as such for a breach of what would later be enshrined, you know, many centuries later enshrined as the Ten Commandments. Possibly they run afoul of the First Commandment, but even there, that's dubious. Notice what they do is they disobey God over his command that they not seek the knowledge that is not legitimate for human beings to know and to seek and to possess, as opposed to the not knowledge that is reserved for God. The original sin was the disobedience against God's command, specifically regarding the one commandment that seemed to precede all those others that, that followed afterwards, thou shalt not seek to know what is not permitted to human beings. This theme is, this theme, as well as the one I've just been discussing, is echoed and rearticulated throughout the Western tradition. Odysseus is told stop, to stop his ears and to avoid listening to the song of the sirens on his way home, warned by Circe, the goddess. What do, what, do the, what do the sirens offer to Odysseus? Well, Odysseus cheats a little bit. He has himself tied to the mast and listens to their song. And what do they offer? Knowledge of all things above and below and upon the earth. 
And for that knowledge, what does Odysseus seek to do? To throw himself over the ship, even though he has seen all of the skeletons lined along the shore. They are no longer enough of a warning. Only the bonds hold him on the boat. This is the cover from my first book, by the way, The Odyssey of Political Theory, almost as famous as my book, Why Liberalism Failed, a great, a great, great painting. It's a book in which I actually knew a lot, unlike uh, nowadays. This, this, this theme of Odysseus as the seeker of forbidden knowledge reappears in Canto 26 of Dante's Inferno. Dante, a great reader of the classics, where he relates that Odysseus, Odysseus relates that his final demise came about as a result of once again sailing out to seek what humans should not and cannot know, in this case, arriving at the very base of the mountain of paradise. And therefore, and thereafter being plunged into the sea and, and being condemned to the eighth circle of hell. That's pretty low. That's about, that's, that's almost nine, which is, the, which, is, which is the worst. Prometheus steals the fire of the gods, giving it to humans so they can survive their naked and unprotected state. And as his punishment, Zeus chains the Titan to the cliff on the Caucasus Mountains, where daily an eagle devours his liver. While to humanity, myth tells us that he sent Pandora and cautioned her against opening the box that he sent with her. But like Adam and Eve proved incapable of resisting the temptation of prying into that which was forbidden and opens it to release a countless host of evils upon humanity. Again, in our tradition, more recent, Dr. Frankenstein uses his scientific knowledge to create a new being, to be like a god, animating dead flesh into a living form, and thereafter seeks its destruction as the creature that turns against its creator. Among Frankenstein's final words, and seemingly the, one of, at least one of the messages of the novel, is the admonition, seek happiness in tranquility and avoid ambition. I could go on. There are countless examples in this tradition of the Western civilization, these and many other moments in our tradition that reflect a deep and abiding debate and a kind of internal ambivalence of humanity toward the thing that makes us human and toward the thing that threatens our humanity. The dual nature of this knowledge is constantly revisited. Adam and Eve are banished from Eden. But in Milton's telling, as, do, as God discloses to Adam toward the closing of his peerless epic, Paradise Lost, God discloses that humanity's loss of paradise will ultimate, ultimately prove to be a fortunate fall, making possible and necessary the incarnation of Christ and the eventual redemption of humanity to, to a condition even superior to that of the life of simple ease in Eden. Prometheus steals the fire of the gods and is punished for it, as is humanity. But note that this theft makes human life possible, without which human beings would have disappeared, as the myth tells us. Our condition is therefore secured, but because of the curse of Zeus, it is one of constant and unceasing anxiety and even misery among our godlike powers. These stories then often contain a dual message, and that is at least part of what these lessons are teaching us. This dynamic of our tradition that I've at least tried to briefly capture is one that is or should be profoundly familiar to us. Daily, we encounter the Baconian confidence in the New Atlantis, especially among the Silicon Valley libertarians, confident that advances in science will advance will alleviate human suffering, limitation, and even our mortality. That's one of the agenda items in New Atlantis, remember, the first one, prolongation of human life. And yet also we daily encounter the fears of the consequences of what might turn out to have been human investigation into forbidden knowledge. I can't turn on the radio these days without a discussion of whether AI will give us all good things or destroy us. Fears expressed from everyone, everyone from the Unabomber to Wendell Berry. We appear to have become a civilization that 
then as now oscillates between two poles, one of Baconian optimism and the pessimism expressed in so many of the stories of biblical and Greek mythology and all the points in between. It is arguably this core feature of our tradition, a continuous thread that constantly appears and reappears in renewed and recognizable forms, whether as mythology or as science fiction, as philosophy or theology, as essays by neo-agrarians or as tweets by tech bros. And once one begins to pay attention, I'm not saying the tweets are part of Western tradition, but you get my drift. Once one begins to pay attention, the drama of the human quandary regarding the fact we are homo techne is everywhere, everywhere imprinted in both the great and the minor texts of the great books of the liberal arts. And this is as it must be and should be because as homo techne, we are simultaneously the makers of tools and thus creatures preserved and in some ways made by our techne, possessing both a nature that is given but also the ability to manipulate and alter, but also potentially to destroy our very nature. While the various tools have come and gone, whether stone hammers or ox-drawn ox -drawn plows or looms or steam engines or nuclear submarines or the iPhone, it is arguable that human beings' oldest and most continuous technology is this very tradition and these very texts that investigate our condition as homo techne. In the West especially, that tradition, that tool, that techne has been developed within the works that constitute what we describe as the liberal arts. And yet, as I make this claim, and one that perhaps you recognize and agree with me, maybe you don't, but as I make this claim, one can't help but be stunned and amazed that even as we feel the press of questions about the nature of this technological age, maybe this new technological age we are entering, and the inevitable demands to think anew about our technology and our nature. At this very moment, what are we seeing? But the decline and the degradation and the rejection of the liberal arts in our great institutions of higher learning whether it's in administrative offices or the speeches of politicians, whether they're left or right, or student choices about majors, even the insecurity of liberal arts professors who aren't sure what they're doing. In a moment when it should be shining, we see its decline. It's a remarkable phenomenon. The liberal arts seem everywhere to be dying out, subject to downsizing of departments or outright elimination, in the widespread belief that they are altogether irrelevant and outdated. The liberal arts appear to be going the way of the ox drawn plow or the spinning jenny. My wife has one, by the way. Yet one more technology destined for a hobbyist like my wife or the museum, if not the dustbin of history. So let me shift here to talk about the liberal arts, my other main theme. Over the past number of years, there, have been a, there has been a concerted effort to defend the liberal arts from this seeming demise. And, and often, perhaps maybe almost most often, by conservatives who regard it as the deepest conveyor of the Western tradition, of, the, of Western civilization. I think many conservatives kind of come of age cutting their teeth, defending the great books and the liberal arts. And yet, for, uh, regardless of that fact, or in spite of that fact, based on my reading, fairly extensive but not comprehensive, of much of this contemporary literature on which many of the proponents of the liberal arts, and perhaps especially conservatives, constitute attempts to do so, they do so by placing it in contrast to, and even in claimed superiority to the merely utilitarian attractions of those who wish to study technological disciplines. The liberal arts are superior precisely because they are useless. This is the argument one encounters over and over again. We find ourselves in a really interesting situation that's comparable, if not quite identical, to that described by the uh, scholar and author C.P. Snow. 
in his famous 1959 Reed Lectures at Cambridge University, subsequently published under the title, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, today widely known as The Two Cultures. Few people read this book anymore, but it kind of, it set the tone for what began as the eclipse of the liberal arts and the rise of the STEM disciplines going back uh, to, to ninth, or the late 50s, early 60s. In that book, Snow appears at least to chastise the two cultures that exist in the contemporary university, the sciences, the technological, the sort of STEM disciplines on the one side and the humanistic disciplines on the others, st stating that they form two polar groups that regard each other with mutual incomprehension. But he was especially critical toward the humanists who he generally and somewhat contemptuously called the literary intellectuals. He portrayed them as snobby and condescending, basking in their superior intellect, while in fact knowing nothing about science. Moreover, he implied that their work was largely useless and they constituted an obstacle to the ongoing advance and the necessary advance to scientific and technological discovery. Progress that at that time, perhaps as much as ours, was desperately needed, especially to alleviate the misery and suffering especially of the world's poor. The literary intellectuals, he argued, were the defenders of a dead and dying world. They were absorbing needed funding and office space and parking spots from the other campus culture that was not a dead and dying world, but seeking, quote, a world that at all costs must be born. I underline at all costs. He didn't, but I do. The condition of the modern university then described by Snow remains very recognizable to us, although its base conditions have changed. If one today encounters a portion of the university with a sense of its own superiority and its high status, as well as significant funding, it's probably not the literary types, the literary humanists. Rather, it's those who partake in the studies of the sciences and associated technologies like engineering, computer science, the STEM disciplines. They are perhaps tolerant of those who labor in the humanities, but, the regard, but they regard them not unlike snow as remnants of a dead and dying world. They enjoy superior funding and status within most universities today. And yet one aspect of snow's analysis, it seems to me remains true. Many of those who work in the area of liberal arts remain aloof and vain, even if they are no longer, as Snow once described them, brash, boastful, and optimistic. Try to find a literary humanist who's brash, boastful, and especially optimistic. There are not many optimists on the human humanist side of the university these days. Most of the defenses of the liberal arts today remain wed to the two cultures theory of Snow regarding the liberal arts and their superiority precisely as non-pragmatic and therefore is morally superior, a morally superior form and object of study. And not only does this argument and understanding do a disservice to the liberal arts in an age when we are indisputably undergoing a technological revolution, but it is a false and a needlessly defensive understanding of the liberal arts. For the questions arising at the heart of today's technological revolutions, the world that Snow argued must be born, bring into focus the issue of whether we can still confidently say that this must be pursued at any cost. Because those costs are becoming very uh, clear, they're becoming clearer to us, not crystal clear, but they're becoming clearer. This claim at any cost as obtuse now as when C.P. Snow, Sir C.P. said it, in 1959. The liberal arts, since its very inception, were the locus of where, where we are especially charged to examine the assumptions of what lie behind the words at any cost. The question at the heart of the liberal arts, of this tradition I've been at least outlining, is the question of the human nature, particularly as it relates to our human beings as creatures who are defined by our liberty. It is, after all, the liberal arts. Looking at examples of the tradition within the liberal arts that we have been exploring, we might frame the challenge or the question of human liberty as follows. Human liberty rests on the extension of our power through our technology. This has been understood since time immemorial. We're not free 
if we don't extend our power through our technology into the natural world. To be wholly subject to the natural world, to a non-technological world, to live without techne would be to be in the condition like Prometheus found us, naked, weak, subject to anything that crawls or preys upon any life upon the earth, if not just dying of you know, the weather out there. So our very liberty, the capacity to be free human beings depends upon our technology. Lacking natural tools like claws or speed or flight or night vision or fur or the ability to live underwater, you name it, means that humanity has only achieved its condition by using its natural ability to manipulate and alter nature. Yet the very natural weakness of humanity and the way we have allayed that has led us to the point where in achieving the condition of liberty, we now also threaten that liberty through our techne. The techne now, in some ways, begins to rule us. We possess the ability to deliberate and choose, to embark on varieties of life paths, to engage in a whole range of voluntary and non-essential activities. Apparently, you people like to walk up and down mountains for no visible reason. Reading fiction, hiking, attending lectures, my God. In addition to getting food and shelter and heat and all those things, we are free because of these techne. And yet at the same time, the same techne appears increasingly to threaten our freedom and thus our very humanness. This is especially due to what many conclude is the inevitableness of technological development. It's inevitability. The thing that in some ways makes us free also has an inevitable trajectory, an unstoppable trajectory. And indeed is an aspect of this technology that is, that is celebrated among the, tech, the most techno-optimist among us, the modern day heirs of Francis Bacon. Perhaps no one encapsulates this celebration of technological determinism more than Kevin Kelly, a name that's both very easy to remember and hard to remember, I mean, easy, to, easy to say and hard to remember, Kevin Kelly, the author of a best-selling book, What? technology wants. Isn't that an amazing title? What technology wants? Technology or technium, as he calls it, forms the basic outworking of tech, is the basic outworking of technological development. It is a force of the universe, as real and as, uh, as unavoidable as the forces of gravity and of motion. I quote Kelly here, the trajectories of technium are long trains of inevitability. While our choices, he writes, can slow them down or postpone them, nevertheless, the ongoing outworking of technium is inevitable and even unstoppable. Like gravity, he writes, this force, technium, is embedded in the fabric of matter and energy. We just think people are inventing stuff. No, it's actually, it's like, it's like entropy, it just works itself out. It follows the path of physics and obeys the laws of entropy, he goes on. And so while human beings have the freedom, we do have freedom. That freedom is whether we choose to accept the inevitable or to try to slow it down. But it's going to happen whether we want it or not. In his view, we should just accept it and indeed accelerate it. The liberty then we have, if we have liberty, is whether to lean into these technological developments or foolishly in his view, to resist its outworking. Interestingly, Kelly, who identifies himself as a libertarian, praises the free market, praises the free market as the space where this inevitableness works out. Notice the interesting paradox here. The space of freedom is where our inevitability works itself out, right? Freedom is where we will experience our fate, if you want to put it that way. He extols what he calls the powerful invention of marketplace logic for its, its capacity to allow the maximal advance of technological development, avoiding then the belief that humans have any collective power to limit its advance or to anticipate any future developments. A particularly interesting chapter in this book, What Technology Wants, is entitled, The Unabomber Was Right. If you haven't read the Unabomber's Manifesto, it's really worth reading. It's a really brilliant piece of writing, and this is what Kelly praises. 
He says, until Kelly wrote his book, he says Ted Kaczynski was the greatest analyst of technology the world had ever seen until Kelly came along. But he lauds Kaczynski in particular for his recognition for technium, he doesn't call it that, technology has a kind of autonomy. It has its own logic and that it develops outside human desires or intention. The Unabomber concluded, quote, freedom and technological, uh, I'm sorry, freedom and technological progress are incompatible. This is Kelly describing Kaczynski. At a deep level, Kelly agrees, the Unabomber was right. He was simply trying, he was wrong, Kaczynski was wrong to try to stop its inevitability. He was wrong for trying to create a revolution to overthrow the technological society. So if Kelly and the Unabomber, at least the non-revolutionary Unabomber, the analytical Unabomber are correct, then the liberal arts are dying for good reason. What's the point of studying anything that has at its core the idea that we are free and that we have to understand ourselves as free creatures if, if human beings actually aren't free? If the condition that made us free will actually result inevitably in our own, in some ways, uh, uh, inevitable bondage to our own technology. If we are governed by iron laws of technological inevitability, why even reflect upon the nature and prospects and potential limits of human freedom? To this, I submit that defenders of the liberal arts have done an exceedingly poor job in making the case for human freedom, mainly by attempting to avoid these challenges arising from modern technology and of emulating the literary intellectuals that were once lambasted by C.P. Snow. And here I make a special point to call out my fellow conservative intellectuals of largely failing to take up this challenge. Instead, many and too many have sought to defend the liberal arts on the grounds of its non-utilitarian appeal, that it's unconcerned with things of the world, that it's primarily concerned with the aim of personal growth. If this is the best that the defenders of the liberal arts can do, given the nature of these contemporary challenges, then we should little wonder that the liberal arts are dying an accelerated death. But I do think we can do better. The first claim that needs to be put aside is that the liberal arts are not useful or even anti-technological. The emphasis here among many defenders of the liberal arts is its very, its appeal lies in its very impracticality, its lack of a utilitarian end. And this is what distinguishes, distinguishes the liberal arts from the inferior approaches that emphasize usefulness and the sort of snotty looking down upon people who study business. I just learned today uh, that uh, business students call our school at Notre Dame, where I teach, the School of Arts and Crafts. It's the School of Arts and Letters. So the disdain is mutual. A recent essay, 2023 essay by conservative intellectual Stephen McGuire. He's currently the Paul and Karen Levy Fellow in Campus Freedom at the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. He's very active on Twitter these days, exposing uh, what's going on at Harvard. Uh, it, his essay demonstrates my point through its title alone. Quote, liberal education is anti-technological. That's the title of his essay. Steve, if you're watching, no hard feelings. McGuire hits many points of contemporary defenders of liberal arts, conservative and non-conservative alike. In contrast to scientific education, which is pursued not, quote, for the sake of truth, tell that to scientists, really, but because it can be applied, the liberal arts are superior because, quote, they are inherently contemplative. They aim not at the, the, the course goal of manipulating and refining reality the noble pursuit of knowing the true, the good, and the beautiful for their own sake. They have no further end. That's their purpose, for their own sake. This argument and others like it take a tradition that from the very outset has been deeply enmeshed in the questions of human reality, of techne, of the promise, perils, and limits of techne and its relationship with human freedom, of the human need to know how our technological nature interacts with our freedom and its limits and washes these away with frequent and obscuring refrains that the only pure object of study is the good, the true, and the beautiful. Such arguments have the effect of rendering abrasing, and I would say exciting, and contentious, and very contemporary tradition into a book club for esthetes. 
No wonder it's dying. The second claim that should be corrected is the celebration of the disconnection of the liberal arts from things of the world. And here I'm thinking of someone I know, consider a friend, but the recent work of St. John's College professor Zena Hitz, a book that's received a lot of note. Apparently MC Hammer has a blurb on it, so that, that got that going for it. This book titled Lost in Thought. This book was actually written during a sabbatical leave supported by a conservative center at my University of Notre Dame and has been celebrated by a range of conservatives, such as Nathan Peters, who runs a conservative institute, not unlike this one, uh, at Columbia University, the Morningside Institute, who in the virtual pages of Public Discourse, which is a conservative online magazine sponsored by the Witherspoon Institute, another institute sort of like this one, founded by Robert George at Princeton University. You see a whole club here in which he said that this book, Lost in Thought, is the strongest case for the humanities to appear in many years. If so, I am again a little surprised that the liberal arts are in steep decline. Why? What does she argue? A liberal arts education centered on engagement with the great books, she writes, should be, quote, a refuge from the world. She goes on, I refer to the world as something that needs to be escaped. When we cultivate an inner life, we set aside concerns for ease or advancement. We forget, if only temporarily, the anxious press of necessities. Here, like McGuire, Hitz praises study for its own sake, allowing us to leave behind worldly concerns and focus on the hidden pleasures of a largely interior form of contemplation. Toward the book's conclusion, she extols such an intellectual life that, quote, properly understood, cultivate, cultivates a space of retreat within the human being, a place where real reflection can take place. Reflection is largely described as an interior activity undertaken within one's own mind at a distance from concerns of the world. And while I would be the last to deny the importance, indeed the attractions of contemplation, of stillness, of an interior reflection, surely it is mistaken to reduce the primary or sole purpose of a liberal education to a truncated and frankly self-involved pursuit. Here again, the actual concerns of the liberal arts and most of the books I just named in the early part of this lecture appear on the St. John's curriculum. Maybe not John Dewey and some tweets are deeply concerned with things of the world and ought to be a positive engagement, uh, encouragement to engage with what are on one hand, perennial questions about the human condition, but questions always that will take on particular cast and salience depending on the current state of the world. The third argument that de deserves demotion, and I'll wind up here, one often advanced by conservatives, is that the purpose of the liberal arts is a kind of self-examination and a self-realization. -re here, Socrates looms large. A recent book making that argument that comes to mind is Roosevelt Monta's somewhat autobiographical defense of the liberal arts entitled Rescuing Socrates. While Monta is, Montas is not himself, I think, would identify as a conservative, in the books, he criticizes those who condemn the liberal arts as overly homogenous, white and male, and at points eviscerates recent and current academic fads such as postmodernism and identity politics. So he's found a, 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 a welcome hearing among conservatives. The book was, uh, in fact, this, this picture is taken from an AEI event, so they like him at AEI. Montes is a charming book that relates his personal autobiograph autobiography and the transformative experience of his encounter with the great books at the Cortex program at Columbia University. Based on that experience, he offers fundamentally similar grounds for widely encouraging the study of the liberal arts in settings both in and beyond the university. He writes that the quote, the driving force behind this book is the way that the liberal arts education has altered and enriched the trajectory of my life. He stresses, quote, the role they, these texts have played in my development as an individual, that they support the relentless pursuit of self-understanding and my own search for self-knowledge. Here again, like those arguments I've just mentioned that stress the anti-utilitarian nature of the study, their value as an escape from the world, the stress of this education is upon what this can do for me as an individual, for my own sake. In each case, one of the predominant prevailing justifications of the liberal arts is the ground of its appeal to individuals as, as, in, as individuals and as an individualistic pursuit. 
a focus on self-understanding, interiority, one that possesses no purpose beyond itself and beyond self-discovery. Surely this is not only wrong from a utilitarian standpoint. How do we make the case for the relevance of, these, of this tradition? But it's wrong from a substantive standpoint that this tradition, in fact, deeply encourages, uh, encourages us to engage with the world, to be, to be engaged, especially with those most pressing questions of the world, to delve into and to discover in new ways, but nevertheless ways that are deeply embedded in our own tradition, what our tradition can teach us about what seem to be deeply contemporary issues, but one which are really all too familiar. Indeed, these arguments are in fact not terribly conservative if we think about what conservatism is, which is to conserve a tradition. The American tradition of the liberal arts formed the core of elite education in the great institutions that today have been splashed across the headlines as not such great institutions. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, among others. Some, some pen, a uh, few that, that are very much in the news. Most colonial colleges until the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century were educations ground in the liberal arts in which these texts were much like and the curriculum was much like that at St. John's. And these, these texts were taught not in the belief that these would encourage interiority or self-examination or, or retreat from the world, but precisely because it was to be taught by those who would lead the world, who would lead the country, who would shape the views and opinions of the country, who would give it its tenor and its flavor. The works designed to cultivate an elite culture to sustain the kinds of virtues that would be especially necessary in a modernizing America. A wonderful book that uh, deserves a bit more attention than I think it receives these days is a work, work by historian D.H. Meyer in a book titled The Instructed Conscience, which is about the rise of moral capstone courses once taught by Ivy League presidents. Imagine Ivy League presidents once teaching moral capstone courses. Probably good if they don't these days. <laughs> Meyer recollects the words of Yale president Noah Porter, who saw the regnant liberal arts as an essential feature of what was already then a society that was rapidly undergoing technological revolution. And this is now Noah Porter in the 19th century at Yale University. Of course, he's speaking, it was a Christian university. Moral science gives every advantage to the Christian, which natural science imparts when she, when she blesses man with the arts. A moral liberal arts education investigates the moral constitution of man through reflection, dealing not only with theory, but the warm and active realities of daily life. Would we preach the gospel to effect, Porter asked? We must do it through their instructors, through this department of knowledge. Once the educated class has been converted then, Meyer writes, through it, moral science must pass into, and now Porter, every portion of the community, to serve as a backstay to the social order, to have effect, to be instructive, to teach those who may not be able to gain from it, not to be interior or individual, but to shape those. This period was described by Meyer as a form of Protestant scholasticism. That sort of appeals to me at least halfway as a Catholic, Protestant scholasticism, an education steeped in the classics of the liberal arts that was not considered merely an analytical discipline, but a study of the ends toward which our actions ought to be directed. Meyer concludes, it was intended to produce not an analytical mind, but a committed intellect and a dedicated will. I think we can do better. We can do better not only because we should value the liberal arts, but we need them. We need them desperately in a moment where we must revisit this tradition that is available to us to be able to speak to the most pressing issues and challenges and conundrums and contradictions of our own condition. To be a free human being is to rely upon our technology, to build out our technology. But if we do so on, uh, without mindfulness, without reflection, and without a certain degree of that ambivalence that's built into our own tradition, we may not be surprised to find ourselves in a condition that is unfree at the end of history. Thank you. I can fall asleep. Excuse me. Try, I'll try to try to make it to the chair before I fall down. Um, so I'll remind you if you are watching. Um, where's that? 
Where's the iPad? Is it here? <coughs> um, well, let me take a, a question from the, from the audience first. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, really interesting. Uh, you explained that this talk is forbidden knowledge, but I think it potentially is, is not forbidden power. The, the, the ways in which technology, like in, in, the, in mythology, it's the knowledge that's dangerous, but in, in the, the more practical sense, it seems like it's things like you know AI controlling us, yeah. or powering surveillance, or bombs, trading bombs, or whatever. It's like Frankenstein is just anything. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. No, in fact, I, I submitted the title before I wrote the, uh, the talk, which is always a danger. Uh, I could have, I could have done one of those things where you, uh, you, you announce that you've changed your title at the beginning of the talk, uh, because I did realize, you know, I, and I took the title from the book by Roger Shattuck. Uh, 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 but it really is much more about, um, in some ways, forbidden application of knowledge uh, and the conundrum of that. You know, at the same time, you know, one of the things that's interesting about Francis Bacon's book, uh, uh, New, New Atlantis, which is a, it's a fragment, it's not a completed book, it uh, was published posthumously, it's not clear he intended it to be published, didn't destroy it, but it's unfinished, so who knows what, uh, what might have, you know, what might have uh, happened on that island. It's premised on this very interesting um, and highly improbable assumption, which is that no knowledge is forbidden for the scientists, but the scientists know exactly what knowledge can be allowed to be given to the political class. So it's, it's, it's premised on the idea that scientists will withhold the knowledge that shouldn't be uh, used or known by those who are likely to use it in ways that are dangerous or foolish, so that the scientists not only will have scientific knowledge, but wisdom. It's, I mean, it, and, and Bacon, I don't think was, a, Bacon was not a dumb man. Uh, so I do wonder whether there's not a little bit of utopia with the letter U built into this E utopia. Uh, that that uh, in some ways he's describing something not unlike Plato's Republic, which is that for the perfect regime to come about, you need perfectly wise leaders. And the problem is, where do you find those kinds of people? In this case, you need perfectly wise scientists to know what knowledge to withhold. Uh, it seems to me that one of the things that we are relying upon today implicitly is a kind of Baconian assumption. If you hear, uh, and I've been listening to this quite a bit lately, a lot of the discussions about AI, a lot of the assumption, prevailing assumption seems to be the scientists will tell the political class what is going to be good and bad AI. Climate change too. Right? And climate change. So that, so that we're going to rely on the scientists and their inherent wisdom to tell us what we need, what we, the, what the political class needs to know. This is a very Baconian theme. Uh, and whether or not this constitutes utopia in one form or another form, it seems to me is a very active question. But it's, I think it'd be valuable for us to see that dynamic for what it is, uh, which is, and, and to raise the kinds of questions that arise from whether or not we can assume the scientists have this kind of wisdom. Because in this case, it's, it's in a sense, trust us that we will know when not to go too far. And of course, that was also the theme of the movie Oppenheimer uh, that uh, did almost as well as Barbie uh, this summer. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, in, this case, in this case, a kind of flip side of that, which is that the scientists just engage in the study of things and the exploration and creation of things. And then we rely, up, we rely upon the wisdom of the political class, what to do with it. Are either of these options really uh, uh, something that we want to rely on for the creation of our utopia? So I, I agree with you with the title. I would have to modify it in a future iteration, but um, it's a it's a great title, and at least you know to 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 give a shout out to Roger Shattuck is worth uh, is worth doing that. Thanks for your interesting. Well, thank you for doing that, man. It's just a quick note. Yeah, it's interesting to think about your own journey and like that. Yes. He seems to have a little bit more power. Yes. Than it seems at first. Yes, but, agree. So I wonder, what what do you, what do you uh, study or do? Uh, history for okay. So um, I want to ask, though, uh, and do a sort of somewhat disingenuous defense of Marxists and others, yeah. even though I share a lot of your reservations. Um, you know, to a certain extent, if you so Bacon and the Advanced Mail Learning cites uh, uh, favorably Machiavelli's Prince Chapter 15, in which he reduces the ideal to the imaginary. Right. And part of that involves questioning all of our sort of a tr uh, traditional sort of allegiances mm -hmm. to God. Right. You know, the good in itself and all the higher longings we have and focusing instead on greater freedom from constraints, yeah. material constraints and 
and uh, you know, sickness of our bodies and also technology making it mm -hmm. And in natural science, you can really see this ramped up in medicine and these technologies. And so one would say that precisely what people like Hitz and Marcus are trying to do is cultivate a sense that there is a sort of higher longing or higher purpose to life mm -hmm. from which we can get a sense of the needfulness of this kind of activity and that uh, so that you could say that that perhaps they are themselves trying to impress upon us this need, but precisely by trying to bring these rarefied pleasures. Now, one could argue that perhaps that's too ambitious of a, of a game, but um, to what extent do you think, if you make the argument from necessity, you're bound to lose to this desire for a liberating education, but that to really support the liberal arts and a liberal education, you do need to cultivate this, this sort of yeah. isolated sort of higher law. So in part, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, criticizing some friends. Um, actually, I don't know Mr. Montes, Professor Montes, but um, Zena and Steve McGuire, I know, uh, and you know, they may not consider me to be friends anymore uh, because I'm, it's also criticizing myself to some extent. I share a lot of these same views. I mean, I'm a student of Aristotle. I love Aristotle's end of the ethics in which he says the highest form of life is the philosophic life. It's the life you can and ought to aspire to lead when you've satisfied all the kind of material conditions of life and you're in a condition of fortune where you're not having every day to go out and you know find and make your bread and and you know sow the fields and so forth so the life of leisure and i'm a big fan of joseph pieper uh leisure the basis of culture i think all of these things are true but they are you know to use the term of art they're necessary but not sufficient uh, it seems to me that the the tradition of the liberal arts with which i ended touching on is a tradition that's as central if not in some ways more central to the liberal arts that I think has been significantly forgotten, I think particularly among conservatives and worryingly among conservatives, which is the connection of liberal arts to culture and to the formation of culture. That in addition to being something that does, you know, for some period of time perhaps, maybe while you're in college or teaching college or uh, sitting in prison for a long time, get to go teach in prison, uh, uh, have this opportunity to think about the higher things and to uh, escape, you know, the, I, was, I thought you were going to mention the passage in Machiavelli where he speaks of retreating to his room and speaking to the, to the ancient teachers, uh, putting on, taking off his dirty robe and putting on his toga. It's a great passage. And I think all of us who've been in, involved in the liberal arts at some level find that and are satisfied by that. But the liberal arts are also form and constitute the culture, Western civilization. They aren't merely something that's interior or something that's appealing because it's useless, but because it is the basis and the backbone of a certain kind of a culture. And by culture, I mean that which is carried forth in inhuman communities and the ways in which we relate to each other as human communities. So the framing and the way in which the liberal arts are justified in what I think is increasingly a dominant way in the conservative world minimizes its role in the shaping of culture. And I think this is particularly problematic, and this would be if I had a longer version of this or this becomes a longer project, this is particularly a problem because it seems to me the only instances and examples we have of genuine ability to be free in relationship to our technology is when there are, in a sense, strong cultural guides and guardrails uh, and norms and beliefs. And here probably one has to add the word religion, but I'll just use the word culture. Uh, of course, you know, I, I, I use this, this uh, example. I mean, this, this is the most, I'm not saying let's all be Amish, but this is at least the, the one big counterexample. Well, if it's inevitable, how do you explain these people? How do you explain these people? If, if, uh, if Kelly is right, how do you explain these people? And these people deliberate. They deliberate over what technology is beneficial for their community and what technology will damage their community. That's the basis in which they value. Now, maybe they get it wrong. Maybe, you know, Maybe a horse-drawn carriage isn't, you know, going to dance. You know, maybe if they go on to, um, I don't know, uh, electric batteries or something, that won't be utterly damaging to their communities. But they give a lot of thought to these and they debate these questions uh, uh, over what, you know, if a new technology is introduced on the standard of what our culture values, how does this con technology conform or not? And there are lots of examples in Western history when this has been the basis on which technological advances and changes have been evaluated. And there's some really interesting moments in history, and you might study some of these, in which, for example, advances in armaments and weaponry were put aside 
It's said Leonardo reveals in his notebooks that he invented something that might have been like a modern bomb. Now, maybe he's a Baconian scientist, but he said, my understanding of the Bible leads me to believe that I should not allow this weapon to be, to be developed and used. And there are lots of instances in which these kinds of moments have happened in our tradition. So that it's not merely to read these texts in order to encounter these debates over, you know, should we be confident about our, our existence as homo technae? Should we be ambivalent about it? It's also the formation of a kind of culture that's capable of deliberating and reflecting upon these things. I actually think that a lot of this, the strand of thinking that um, inhabits especially conservative thinking goes back to this guy, Alan Bloom, uh, and The Closing of the American Mind. The Closing of the American Mind, which was a book that came out when I was just entering graduate school at the University of Chicago and was extremely excited to study with this guy, I thought, like many people, was like the greatest conservative book ever written. And yet, having gone back and reread it, re re it many years on and off over time, I realized it is actually one of the greatest anti-conservatives books ever written, <laughs> because it is a book that is deeply opposed to the idea of culture and tradition. That it, that it begins, the book begins by saying, I went to the University of Chicago as a boy, or a Jewish boy that grew up in Gary, Indiana, thinking that what I'd been raised in was the true stuff. And for the first time in my life, the scales fell off from my eyes, and I saw that there was a realm of freedom. It was like being released from the cave, going up from the cave and seeing the light above. That was his encounter at the University of Chicago. And the great, the great appeal of the liberal arts education is that it allows us to be freed from the constraints of our particular traditions and our cultures. It's not to say that traditions and cultures shouldn't be examined and questioned and challenged, but the, one of the great founding texts of the conservative tradition is premised on the idea that what a liberal arts is, is that which allows us, in a sense, to deconstruct cultures, to, uh, to rise above them, to, to, to regard them as nothing more than caves. And yet, in some ways, the liberal arts are the basis of a culture. And if we don't see them for that, then I think we have, in a sense, no chance to carve out spaces of freedom when it comes to deliberations over technology. I want to use my, my prerogative as moderator sure. to follow up on, because yeah. I think there's a fascinating idea that you've raised, uh, or profound idea, um, that the liberal arts one, are One time in a lecture, to... that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, we'll take it. We'll take it. Um, if, so if the liberal, art, liberal arts are so deeply connected to culture, uh, do you have something to say about how uh, our retreat or the conservative retreat from the liberal arts um, or uh, retreat from the practical use of, or, of the liberal arts has affected our culture? Do you think that's happened? Yeah. And how? So one of my, um, one of my students uh, from my Georgetown days, I'm extremely proud of, when you get to the point in your life when you're quoting your students, your former students who've now gone on to write their own things, you know, you know, you know you're both, you're approaching death and uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that your life has at least had some worth to it. Uh, so one of my students, uh, uh, who is now an assistant professor of politics at uh, Catholic University of America, his name is John Askinus, write that name down and underline it, keep an eye on him, he's a rising star. He wrote an essay, a kind of homage to his old teacher, uh, uh, which appeared in the online journal Compact. It's called, Why Conservatism Failed. It's a great title. <laughs> I, wish I'd, I wish I'd thought of it, Why Conservatism <laughs> Failed. Great, great title. And he argues in this book that the conservative conservatism at its core has been the defense of tradition, right? That, it, that it's, whatever the difference is within conservatism, it's been a defense of the idea of tradition in various forms. And there's kind of maybe a little bit of an overlapping consensus that we won't investigate too much into what tradition we're defending. We just all agree that tradition is good. He argues that in this essay that conservatism has failed because tradition is indefensible in a world of unfolding technology like ours. It's not that liberals have defeated conservatism, it's technology has defeated uh, um, uh, conservatism because, con because technology overturns all tradition. And of course, this is, this is a story of time immemorial. I mean, the, the agricultural revolution overturns the hunter-gatherer traditional society. You know, Edmund Burke of the hunter-gatherer society, we don't even know his name because nothing left of that. 
Wendell Berry is the Edmund Burke of the Agricultural Society. And what does he do most of his time? He writes lament about that which is lost and probably that which is not coming back. He would like it to come back, but it's probably not. Conservatives today write about a lament. I mean, those of us of a certain age lament an age when friendship meant you got, you went, you got together with people and you had you know, face-to-face -face time with them and you would enjoy interpersonal relationships. Maybe that's not quite coming back in the same way. So technology by its nature, you could say, overturns traditions. The technology we have today, as John argues, is that, uh, and I'll quote from him, the right has lost not the battle of ideas, but the battle uh, that has resulted from technological change that dissolves the context in which tradition once thrived. So tradition itself has ceased to exist, he suggests. That we live in a society that, in, in, to use the term from my own book, in a, in a kind of anti-culture. The dismantling of a culture which I think is what we're experiencing, is the result of a society in which if a tradition and a culture is that which is the passing on of knowledge and understandings and wisdom of the past to future generations, that's a useless activity when anything from the past, even the near past, is an obstacle to understanding what's happening tomorrow or the day after or even today. Right? So in the, in the contemporary home, if something goes wrong with the computer, you always try to find the youngest person in the house, not the oldest, right? So usually mom or dad needs help from the kid. So we are in the midst of a revolution in which the traditional, the cultural is constantly being overturned by the new and the constant revolutionary new. It seems to me if this is right, if this argument is right, it certainly seems to be, uh, to have a lot of uh, persuasive power to it. Then if conservatism wants in, a, in some ways to be, to exist, it needs to confront this question of technology directly and in ways that aren't simply a kind of head in the sand, we're just gonna think about not to, not to denigrate uh, these, these really wonderful works, uh, but, but that it can't simply be, it allows us to think the high thoughts, that, that to conserve a culture will require us in some ways to have a culture and to have a culture will mean in some ways thinking and developing the ability to think, reflect, to judge, uh, and even judge with ambivalence developments in technology. Now, what does that mean on the ground and in practice? Well, you know, if I if I have a chance to work on this, this these are things I'll be developing. These are these are arguments I, I hope to develop. But it, but it seems to me there's a particular conservative dimension to this thinking that relates deeply to the status of culture, and whether culture in some ways can can be thought to exist in a technological age such as ours. And this should be worrying and much more on the minds and in the front of the minds of those who care about tradition and culture, uh, Western civilization, than I think perhaps it is at the moment. Huh? Yeah, I'm sitting there wondering if uh, Patrick Deneen is utopian uh, with you yeah. about the liberal arts. Uh, An EU or you? With you. Uh, no place, yeah. No place, Probably. yes. Uh, yeah. At least not this place. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say, uh, first, it seems to me, Maybe this is just that big contrarian and provocative. It seems to me the biggest threat now is the humanities take over the sciences, uh, mm -hmm. which is that the corruption of the humanities is destroying the sciences. I just, uh, we read uh, Marcuse in class the other day. One thing that's fascinating is Marcuse says in passing, well, of course, uh, scientific freedom is inviolable. Yeah. Right? Scientific freedom is no longer inviolable, right? Which yeah. is that. The, the relativism, the all the crap in the humanities is now threatened to destroy the, the science yeah. uh, in these uh, things. The second thing is, um, uh, um, you sort of talk about, we should talk about uh, technology and that sort of thing, but <clears throat> sort of my observation of history is that it's usually the bad guys, uh, pretty much invariably the bad guys who wanted to control technology, mm -hmm. whether they, you know, whether it was, um, the, the printing press, right? They don't want ordinary people to uh, to get uh, to get knowledge. Um, whether it's the bad guys who are censoring Twitter, uh, you know, under misinformation. Whether it's the Chinese uh, uh, regime that's uh, censoring technology and information and, and those sorts of things. And so, um, if we sort of, you know, the 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 we in some sense often seems to turn into the powerful weaponizing uh, the control of technology uh, to suppress freedom and uh, individual 
flourishing for, for a bad end. Yeah. So it seems like what the conservatives are sort of saying, and I'll just close on this, is it reminds me of sort of a Albert J. Knock kind of remnant argument, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is maybe the best we can do is retreat uh, to our to our, our IV tower mm -hmm. uh, because the the world's going to hell. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and maybe we don't want to like yeah. empower the humanities in its current state. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a lot of what's going on. And I guess my question would be just to that last point, how's that working out for us? Are they are, are they are they leaving us in peace to to right to uh, uh, no I, I think I take this as two very good and challenging questions that I've been mulling over myself I, in some ways I think the first one is is relatively I'm not saying it's easy but it's easier at least to answer which is that um, the the broken state of our humanities today the deeply broken state of our humanities is in significant part it seems to me because the humanities in, in some respects, I think in certain respects have ironically adopted the same kind of ethos of um, a certain vision of technological liberation, which they think can be achieved through a kind of form of the effective deconstruction of human nature through a kind of literary technology, uh, if I can put it that way within the tools of the humanities, what can we do that are being attempted as well in the natural sciences, which is to fundamentally alter and control our natures. And if you think about where the hot button issues are today, well, those hot button issues are not only, of course, the scientific alteration of human nature in the form of you know, genital mutilation and so forth, but the idea that there is no such thing as a man and woman, right? An idea that has to in some ways precede the normalization of that technological outgrowth. So there's a kind of deep way in which the, the most radical elements in the humanities and the social sciences have, uh, have ironically adopted this kind of unreflective belief that our liberty consists in our complete control of our own natures. If that disturbs you as it disturbs me, then we should actually be a bit disturbed with this deep assumption within at least the most optimistic of those sort of techno-optimist views. I th it seems to me also for this reason, the those who are combating this need a far more powerful and attractive strategy. And it's a strategy that doesn't betray the truth of the matter, but a strategy to combat this at the level of defending the humanities, not as a retreat, but as an advance, that this is what we can offer. This is what uh, the, the humanity is. This, I don't wanna reduce it to all we're gonna do is study the technological elements. I mean, that would be too reductionist, but to, to give that a significant place because it should address where we are and the concerns that we have. And if it is about securing human liberty, if that's what the liberal arts are, understanding human liberty, then that should be at the forefront of what we're thinking and doing. And, and therefore, I think, uh, given these, uh, these challenges that we're facing from this, this particular part of the world, the only chance we have to begin to retake some territory and I'm not saying this is where I, I am a bit more utopian in the U sense. Uh, I'm not saying that that's going to be uh, automatic, but I do think it could begin to win back some, some territory, possibly. On the question of the bad guys, I would say it's a, it's a mixed story. I would just say it's a mixed story. Uh, it's, um, it's certainly the case that there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence that those have attempted to stop the advance of technology have proven sort of to be on the other side of history. There's also a Whig version of these stories. There's a Whig version, right? Which is those who know the, the Whig, the Whig uh, idea of history is those who win the history get to write the history and they tell them in a particularly sort of self-congratulatory way. Maybe the biggest example of this are the Luddites, uh, which, you know, if now I'm sure there are people, you know, if you haven't thought this already, uh, people watching this are saying this guy is just a Luddite <laughs> as, as, a, as an insult. Of course, the Luddites are an interesting example of a, uh, of a, a, a form of culture uh, in which you had a kind of, a certain kind of um, professional expertise and a culture uh, that developed around those forms of work that were being displaced by machines being displaced by developments uh, that were taking place. It, was a, it wasn't just a technological revolution, it was also a political and economic revolution uh, that was taking place. And one can say they were simply on the wrong side of history, but they represent one of the ways in which to speak of a kind of culture that can be a space where we can have these kinds of deliberations 
they represent to me the way in which especially certain kinds of professions can generate internal standards of excellence and practice and tradition, and I'm using these in the kind of McIntyrean sense of practice, develop a kind of sense of practice of certain kinds of excellences, and that word of virtuosity related to the word virtue, that I think we shouldn't toss aside as outdated or outmoded technology. One area where I think we ought not to consider just completely throwing it aside is if, if it's in a good state, the professoriate represents that kind of virtuosity or ought, to rec or ought to constitute that kind of virtuosity. The people who in a sense set the standards of their own work and those who will join the circle of their work. That's, the, uh, that's at, at their best what they do. And you could say, I think today that we have a, almost a kind of a certain kind of disruption of that in a anti-Luddite way. If the professor, professor was once Luddite, administrators and HR people and accreditation agencies have more or less eviscerated what was once the internal standards and practices of a professoriate that cared about things like knowledge and wisdom and understanding and the development of, of, of learning. Uh, so I, I think we need to be careful about being um, blanket. And this is where I think the ability to deliberate and not just be, and this is where I find you know, the, those who are anti-technological, so maybe like the Ted Kaczynski's of the world are as problematic as the Kelly's of the world. And we need far more supple understandings that are gonna occup occupy these spaces of genuine ability to examine and understand our condition, and this doesn't mean just stopping technology. It also means making sure if we utilize it, we utilize it in ways that are virtuous and good and not evil because it's, it's like pharmacon, you know, the Greek word pharmacon, it means both medicine and poison. There's almost no technology that's okay, that's a good technology, that's a bad technology, every, every single one, nuclear, nuclear energy, well, power things and it can blow things up. So we need, we need to exercise and develop these capacities for judgment that go beyond these kinds of blanket, either assertions of techno-optimism or assertions of techno-pessimism. Excuse me. I have four people on the queue and we have four oh, minutes. So oh, I'm going to ask both okay. of you, uh, all of you to be as concise as you can. So Zach, Eric, Iskra, and Trent. I'm doing so why don't I just sort of grab you? Thank you. Uh, Eric. Same. Iskra, are you, are you I'm liking dinner? how this is going. <laughs> I'm not liking how my dinner's shaping up. <laughs> Like it. So, um, the philosopher um, Agnes Collard was recently sort of waked over the calls for this obit she wrote um, that said something like, I'm a humanities professor and I don't really know what the humanities are for. And um, there were all these people saying, you know, oh, how dare she say this when the humanities are on the chopping block. Um, but very few people ventured any response to her question. Um, in fact, in the thread I saw, I don't think anybody did. It was a very good question, so you know, people didn't like her answer, but they were not suggesting any kind of alternative. Um, and I think you're essentially sort of asking the same question. Um, and I, you know, I really like the direction, but I'm a little bit worried about the answer. So I don't know that we have any particular body of knowledge to transmit. Um, or that we can promise that we're going to set any kind of example. Um, but also, I'm not sure that we need that um, because it, it just sort of seems to me that, you know, I mean, there's something about being human um, that makes the humanities in some way um, inevitable. Um, I mean, we have these capacities, imagination and you know, kind of a tendency to explore more and to get bored. And there are no sufficient conditions for human happiness. Just no matter what we do, we can always get tired of it. And, you know, we, we just kind of, okay, well, what else is there? Yeah. Um, and that's where the humanities come in. Um, and if you take that out, you know, what you're kind of left with is, well, why aren't you happy? You know, like you got everything. And it's, yeah, but I'm a human and it's somehow on my not. I'm not sure if there's a question there, but, <laughs> but it's a great, well, no, it's a great, uh, uh, 
Well, anyway, go. Be my alternative response. Yeah, sure. To your question. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll respond very briefly. That was there one more? Response okay. had to do with forbidden knowledge. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I think we don't actually have that, but also we don't need it. Was there one more? You can, yeah, you can let that stand. Uh, yeah. Trent, to finish us off. Uh, you suggested that conservatism is perhaps being defeated by technology. How do you think technology is eroding Western economic liberalism, the rule of law tradition, and morality like found in the Bible? Don't these institutions have value regardless of the current state of technology? Uh, so these are two really, you know, questions calling forth very brief responses, I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, you know, the, the question uh, about, you know, the humanities, it's really less a question, more uh, kind of a, a sort of an agenda, a research agenda, but also an alternative way of thinking about this. I, I, as you were speaking, I was thinking a uh, mutual friend of myself and Chris, Chris Kopp, um, uh, um, Peter Lawler, uh, who passed away a number of years ago, wrote a book called Stuck with Virtue, in which he, he he confronted these kinds of questions and said, well, no matter what technologies we develop that we think are going to assuage our misery, uh, we'll never develop them. Uh, we are, we're born in some ways to be miserable uh, and unsatisfied. He's very Augustinian and Pascalian in the sense. Uh, and so we're just gonna be stuck with virtue. We're gonna be stuck with the need uh, always to be uh, creatures that are seeking for what, what the good is. And I think that in some ways that may be the uh, that may be the sort of compensatory, uh, um, you know, yeah, assuaging of the of the concerns that we may eliminate our own humanity. Uh, I, I'm not. I, I've never been, uh, and wasn't then as sanguine as Peter was. That will just that our misery will save us. Uh, it, it, <laughs> uh, it's it, that may have been just his own constitutional inclination. Uh, but it seems to me that we're, among other things, developing. Somebody mentioned the, you know, the concentration drugs. We're developing all kinds of both very low level as well as increasingly high level pharma pharmaceuticals that are going to cure our misery and cure our our desire to know what humanity is. Uh, so I, I, I'm not as sanguine about that. Um, and it, it it does seem to me that uh, at least a major agenda item of those who to move to the last question of those who are seeking to, in some ways, preserve Western civilization is to confront a new, the question of, or, or to conf confront in a new way, a very ancient question of human techne. And so your, your, your question, I think really is, it's a great question. It is, it's the question that's animating this project of mine. Here's, I mean, reviewing these materials, here's a truth that I have to acknowledge. Having said all that I've said about the need to be reflective, my hopefully inspiring answer uh, about, you know, our capacity to act as reflective thinking human beings to preserve the space of freedom. You have on the one side, the kind of the story of the West that states are kind of technological, scientific, uh, mastery. And then you have another part of the story that says, well, there's forbidden knowledge and you shouldn't investigate that. And we always fail. We always fail in that temptation, right? <laughs> every one, almost every one of these stories is that human beings can't not look in the box, can't not eat the apple, can't not listen to the sirens, can't not journey out to try to find the base of the mountain of Paradiso. It seems to be built into us uh, to transgress. Uh, so even as I suggest that we need, a, we need a, a new research project, if you want to put it that way, or I think a new way of thinking about it, a very old and new way of thinking about the liberal arts uh, and, it, and what it can offer to us, it's necessary to acknowledge that it seems to be sown into human nature that we are incapable of not treading where perhaps we ought not to. And this may include ultimately threatening the things that make us human. It seems that we are grow growing closer to that point. Um, but I just think in the name of human liberty, it's, a, it's an agenda that's uh, not to be put aside. It's, it may sound odd as the critic of liberalism that I'm defending liberal, that I'm defending liberty, uh, but I'm defending a kind of liberty that I think is a genuine form of liberty, 
which among other things a, means a kind of self-mastery and at times a kind of self-limitation. Uh, and whether human beings are capable of that, that's one of the great charges and challenges uh, that we see in our own tradition. I would say though um, that the other side of the story of Adam and Eve is the, the three temptations of the de uh, in the desert of Jesus. Now it helps that he's the son of God. I'm not gonna, not gonna uh, uh, put that aside, that, that helps. But I'm sure he was pretty hungry when he gets offered the bread and uh, you know, it's not beyond the, the, the idea of, of seeking power. Uh, but, the, but the idea that the man God uh, could be offered these temptations and say no to each, and that would be an exemplar for us. That perhaps that as part of these liberal arts is an understanding that one of the things we aspire to as a civilization that's shaped and formed in this tradition, one of the books is the Bible, that this tradition teaches us not only of the likelihood of our susceptibility to temptation, but the possibility of our ability to resist it in the name of a higher form of freedom. So, That's a great, great note to end things on. Please join me in thanking our speaker.